So for centuries, humankind has been polluting the Earth. But more recently, we've taken this pollution to new horizon, into space. Starting with the beginning of space exploration, in 1957 with Sputnik, every year we've been sending more and more objects into space. The problem is that most of these objects remain in space. And so you can imagine that everything that has been used to launch a telescope, to launch a satellite, satellite themselves, shuttles, bits of rockets, is accumulating at different orbits. All these orbits are actually used by man to actually do uh, uh, research. So you have objects gathering at what we call the low Earth orbit and at the geostationary orbit. And the issue is that most people don't realize how much we depend on space. Everything we do from communication, GPS, transportation, banking, everything that we do in our daily life depends on the space industries. There is cell phone on the tables. Without uh, space industries, this would not be working. And so this dependence means that we are really sensitive to what's happening to the, the space junk, the space debris. Now, these debris travel at about eight kilometers per second. So you can imagine that if a debris hits, for example, a communication satellite, that's the end of it. Even worse, can you imagine if it hits the International Space Station? On average, every year, NASA has to do one maneuver to avoid those debris. And this problem is only going to get worse. The numbers of debris increases as we spend most things into space. And so eventually, uh, the number of, of objects will be too hard to essentially manage. You can see some examples of spikes here on this graph that shows the increase of debris caused by those collisions. So it's a very, very, very uh, important problem. So to clean up space, there's been a few ideas on how to do this directly by cleaning up those debris, like cleaning up all satellites that are no longer in use. The problem with this is that it's extremely expensive. Doing it from space is also very technologically challenging. We don't have a technology to do what's on this picture, for example. So it's a very hard challenge, and it has to also to scale. However, at, in Australia, at the Australian National Universities, we're proposing to do this from the ground with industry partners. It's much easier because from the ground, it's cheaper. You can upgrade, you can test. Things are much more manageable. And so what we're hoping for is to come up with a mitigation plan to avoid this increase of debris, which eventually will, will lead to a cascading effect. And the techniques that we're using are already known. We're using uh, the technologies that Celine talked about, adaptive optics. Essentially, astronomers use adaptive optics to take the signal from the light from the stars and basically clean up the effect of the atmosphere of light coming down. But there is no reason why we can't do this the other way around and clean up the light going up into space. If we do this, we can essentially track debris, know exactly where their orbit is, and then eventually determine when two, two debris are likely to collide. When we determine this, we can basically attempt at changing the orbit of one of those debris and avoid a collision, which would be dramatic. To do this, we need actually two lasers. There's one laser, which is what we call a guiding laser, but so the same one we use in astronomy. We basically shine light at the top of the atmosphere where there is a sodium layer, atoms of sodium, which we basically make glow and use this as a beacon, as a reference to basically determine what the atmosphere is doing. And this information is sent into another laser that we're sending upwards, and then we can basically focus very accurately onto those debris and change their orbit. Now, these lasers are very big, very expensive, lots of power, and extremely impractical. So we're working on, on technologies that basically allow us to scale those lasers and make them a bit cheaper, a more practical, and, and lighter. So you see Celine here working on a semiconductor-based laser, which basically uses an everyday technology. Semiconductor lasers you use, in, uh, for example, in your CD pliers. Uh, laser pointers are semiconductor lasers. Communication fiber lasers also use the same technology. All, we, all which we're trying to do is basically change the semiconductor recipe of those lasers and scale them to this kind of application here. The problem is that the space industry is already worth billions, and it's increasing every year at a very fast pace. But the industries on the ground that depend on these space applications is even too hard to calculate. It's a large part of the global industry. And so spending some money on, on, on tracking stations is only costing millions of dollars, and so there is a good investment to be made here. However, the problem is not just technological or a question of money. 
is also a policy and a political issue that to, deal, to be dealt with. Space doesn't have borders. There is no nation who's in charge of anything, but it involves government, military. It involves private companies, uh, space industries, uh, NASA, etc., etc. And so unless we come up with a way to work together and determine who's going to basically be in charge of this cleanup, then our way of life are, are basically in jeopardy. And also space exploration may end up stopping at the moon. Thank you very much.